Okay, welcome to another Orbiter 2010 video. And in this video, we are here at Mars. You can see I'm by the Olympus base. We're on the runway. And uh, what we're going to do in this flight is we're going to go from Mars back to Earth. I'm not sure that I actually have done a direct Mars to Earth flight video ever. I don't think I have. The one time that I went back to Earth from Mars, it was the uh, Mars venus <clears throat> sling over to earth and that wasn't really the best approach to get back to earth um but it was just something to do to show off the uh, sling so in this flight we're really going to focus mostly on the execution of the flight and not so much the transex planning we're actually going to use uh, i've already got the transex plan set up for getting uh, for the escape plan, but we're going to use IMFD for all of our navigation once we get into orbit. The main thing I really want to focus on here is to show a little bit about just how just like dead on precise that you can be in your in your fuel planning if you want to be. So let me go ahead and switch camera views here. And let me tab over to the uh, spreadsheet and hopefully Hopefully this is interesting to you guys and not not boring. You'll have to leave your comments down below and let me know what you think. I personally find fuel planning and setup really interesting. So let's just kind of cover what we're looking at here because the spreadsheet's changed quite a bit since the last time I showed it. Uh, right here at the top in step one, and I labeled these by steps, I got this idea uh, from Dimitri because he's made a very similar spreadsheet. His is probably better than mine, but again, since I made mine, I'm more familiar with it. Uh, but I got this idea from him to do like step one, step two, step three. Uh, but in step one, we're just going to select our engine ISP. And for now, for this flight, we're going to have to have it at default. I wanted to do this in the expert configuration, but even with uh, one crew member, I couldn't do it because there was not, even if you put two fuel modules in the um you know, in the payload area, there's just not enough fuel to get back to Earth, really, from Mars. At least not if you're going to launch from the surface. If you have a launcher to put the XR-2 into orbit, then you can probably do it. Actually, I'm sure you can, because the inj the actual injection cost is fairly is fairly low. So step one, ch ch check uh, to st set up our engine ISP. Step two is our fuel tank capacity. We're going to have a main fuel tank that's 100% in this case in one of the previous videos it was it was lower than that but even though even though the fuel tank capacity here is set to 100 percent, we're not going to fill it up to 100 percent, and i'll explain that in a minute do we want to use dvs uh, rcs as delta v yes and i added this option that i talked about do i want to have an scram fuel or not and in this case since we're going launching from uh, mars we're going to say no and that's reflected over here. You can see the internal scram mass is zero. Number of crew members, 14. Default locks loadout. The mission duration is 237.03. That comes from Transex. Let me actually just double check that. 237.4. And I have 237.03. So it's basically the same. And I gave myself a two-day surplus of locks so with your mid-course corrections and whatnot you could either increase your uh, tr increase your velocity a little bit and end up at earth a little bit sooner or you could decrease your velocity a little bit and end up there a little bit slower so you want a little bit of surplus i find that going from uh from earth to mars or from mars to earth or from earth to venus it's really close to whatever the number uh, whatever the number transex gives you unless you have really bad mid course corrections the uh, mission duration is really close so i don't really feel the need to have a bunch of extra locks crew mass again this is calculated that's why it's in blue uh, i don't type that in this is how the the total mass of all the crew is that number and this is how much locks we require in kilograms based on the number of crew that we have and based on the, the time of flight. Now, do we want to include the CHM? Uh, we're going to say yes. And do we want, uh, or rather, uh, what are we going to have in cargo slot two and cargo slot three? So this is, this is set up as a little bit different than I did it before 
where where before I had all the cargo options listed, and then I would say whether or not they were included. Uh, this is how Dimitri does it, and it makes more sense. So we we actually want to look for in the payload section setup. We kind of want to look down here at our recommendations, and maybe I should actually put this in like another color. So before we select our cargo slot two and three. Uh, this spreadsheet has done has done the calculations for us and tells us that for our internal LOX tank, we want to have that filled to 100%. And for our cargo slot number two, we want to select a, a full LOX container, but we only have to have it filled 55.3% or 5,831.66 kg. And that's what I have here for the override is a uh, 5832 you can see it's just rounded it's just rounded up to the to the whole number and then for cargo slot uh, the re the locks recommendation for cargo slot 3 of course is nothing because we didn't even need a whole uh car we didn't even need a whole full locks for the number 2 let alone do we need another one and then down here for the fuel recommendations uh we're recommending since we're going to use RCS as main fuel we obviously need to have 100% of the RCS filled up. And then for the main fuel, in order to get the uh, DV requirement that we have for this mission, the main tank only needs to be filled to 49.22% or 6,592 .9, which I have here for that override uh, rounded up to the nearest number. So that's the setup, and this will t this part tells us how much Delta V we will have. It doesn't tell us necessarily that we'll have enough for the mission, because that, that depends on how much Delta V we need. This just tells us how much Delta V we will have. And based on that setup, uh, through the rocket equation, we have 6,223 meters per second. Now... This is the advanced fuel planning, and I'm kind of thinking maybe I'll move this to a separate page because this part can technically be optional. Like if you wanted to, you could just say, you know, give me all the fuel uh, that I can possibly carry, and then this calculation will tell you what that number is, and then you can just fly, and if you've got enough, great, and if you don't, that's okay too. The advanced fuel planning is to help you know for sure whether or not you're going to have enough fuel to get to your destination. So I calculated that the launch uh, to orbit, this is, this is on Mars, is going to cost me about 4, uh, about 4,037 meters per second. Now, we, I did a uh, Mars orbit exercise that I posted on Orbiter Forum last year, and we found that by by taking off and getting into orbit around Mars, if you you know you take off like a like an airplane where you fly, you know like ninety degrees down the runway and take off, that's the most efficient way to get into orbit. And you can actually do that and get into a ninety degree orbit or take off and get into orbit and have a ninety degree heading with about four hundred meters less than this. But the reason this is high, higher here is because my launch requirement is that I'm gonna to have to have a 15 degree heading. So my 15 degree heading means that it's actually gonna be more efficient for me to hover up off the ground, rotate, and then use the main engines to take off and get into orbit that way. But that hover time is gonna cost additional fuel and going out at a, at a 15 degree heading instead of a 90 degree heading is gonna significantly increase the cost to get to orbit. And there's really no way to calculate that that I know of. You really just have to uh, do two or three test flights to see what it's going to cost uh, delta v wise to to get into orbit for a particular for a particular body for a particular heading for a particular atmosphere. But um, I found consistently that the, the the numbers are pretty pretty much always the same as long as you can fly more or less the same way. Now the injection cost, fortunately, we can calculate, and we can calculate it to a degree of accuracy that's probably less than 1%. It's really close. So whatever this number says is exactly what our injection burn is going to cost within two or three meters per second. And usually that difference that you end up with once you're in orbit 
is all due to the difference in altitude. Like if you have this number is calculated based on a 200 by 200 orbit. So if you end up in orbit with a uh, periapsis that's like 189 for some reason and your apoapsis is 202, then it's going to change the cost of your injection ever so slightly. But I calculated, not there, but here, the cost of going back to Earth uh, doing this other, using this other spreadsheet that I made. And we just simply, we, we put our plan into Transex, we do all that, and then we copy and paste those numbers into here, which I've already showed in another video. Once we copy paste those numbers into here, it tells us what our total delta V will be. And if we alt tab over to Transex, we can see that the total delta V is now given to us in Transex. This wasn't always the case, so it was necessary to calculate it outside of Transex. But it used to be, uh, but now now it's given to you in Transex. So you want to check that number, 2505. And we have here 2505. And this number should be exactly the same as what you see in Transex. Because this calculation, which you can see up here, this is the exact same calculation that Transex uses. So if this number's off by even one meter per second, there's something wrong. But this number is not the the total cost of going to your target uh, in in this case our injection cost is actually cheaper by about by almost 500 meters a second and i think that's because this time instead of going from earth to mars so instead of climbing the hill this time we're going from mars to earth we're going downhill so our injection cost is actually cheaper than what we come up with here in transex as being our total delta v and someday I'll have to do a video on how to calculate the injection cost. Uh, Dimitri's actually writing a Transex manual that that explains this, and it's going to be it's going to be really good. So this number here, twenty thirty five sixty six, that is our injection cost. That's the calculated injection cost, and that's what I put in here, twenty thirty five sixty six. Now this tells me. So I'm starting with this much delta V on the ground. And once I take off, get into orbit, and then complete the injection burn, I will have 189.49 meters per second of delta V left after those two burns. Then I'm going to calculate, and I also added this stuff to my, to my calculations. The, the, uh, before I showed the delta V gain, due to LOX consumption, but I didn't show, but I didn't have the calculation included for what if you do a mid-course correction. And it really doesn't make a huge difference on short fl on, sh on uh, flights where your Delta V budget is so low because when you only have like 100 or, you know, 50 or 100 Delta V after the injection burn, you, you just can't gain that much more. It's not like you're magically getting more fuel as you travel through space. The only thing that's changing is the LOX is reducing. You still have the same amount of fuel in kilograms. The kilograms of your fuel doesn't change. It's just the the ability for those kilograms to con turn into DV increases because you're pushing less mass. But nevertheless, I included this here now in the spreadsheet where we have the mid-course correction planning phase. And this just says when we will we perform the mid-course correction. Uh, and, then, and this wants to know the number of days. And I'm just going to say that we're going to do it at 100 days because our total flight time is 237. And probably somewhere between 80 and 90 days we'll want to do a mid-course, uh, between 80 and 100 days we'll want to do a mid-course correction for going back to Earth. So in the time that we leave Mars, we have 189.49. In that 100-day period, the amount of locks that we burn through is going to net us an additional 19.79 meters per second worth of delta V, giving us a grand total of 209.28 worth of delta V at that 100-day mark. When we get to the point of doing the mid-course correction, we will, have, we will have that amount of delta V. Now, I'm estimating that the cost of doing mid-course corrections between Mars and Earth is going to be about is going to be about 150. I've not yet figured out a way to do like one burn, basically like you can do when you go from Earth to Mars. The the trip back 
in toward the sun seems to be uh, doesn't seem to be quite as good and i think the moon has a lot to do with that as well because the earth you know wobbles quite a bit and trans and imfd as good as it is it's not perfect but it's a lot better than transx if we were uh, using transx i actually have and i put it in my spreadsheet uh, which navigation MFD are we using? Are we using IMFD or are we using Transex? And if we're using IMFD, we configure, um, actually, this should be 150. I forgot to change that, but that's okay. Um, I'm not going to do it now. But if we're using Transex, I figure we're going to probably use about twice as much Delta V, at least, and sometime, in some cases it would be much more than that. Okay, so then after the mid-course correction is done, we estimate that we're going to have 59.28 meters per second of delta V remaining. And then after we arrive at our destination, we will have gained an additional 9.08 meters per second of delta V after we did that mid-course correction or that series of mid-course corrections. Now, this number is a little bit difficult to estimate because we're, this is assuming one mid-course correction, and quite likely we're going to have this one, and then we're going to have number two and probably number three as well. And then it won't be until we get within 0 0.1 uh, of the gravitational influence of Earth that we start just using linear translation to fine-tune things a little bit. So what I'm going to do in uh, another update of the spreadsheet is I'm going to actually probably move all this stuff, all the advanced field planning to its own page, and I'm going to actually add in mid-course corrections at least uh, two and three also. Uh, when, again, when you're starting off with just that amount of delta V after you're leaving your target or after you're leaving your starting planet, the delta V gain is very insignificant, but if we were going to say maybe uh, Earth to Jupiter, and we were going to take, uh, and we were going to plan on having several thousand delta V with, after the burn was complete, which would be necessary. Then we then our dV gain due to LOX consumption would be significant, and we would probably want to know what that was between you know one mid course correction, second mid course correction, and third, and so on. So finally, when it's all said and done. We have, um, actually I left that blanked, that should be at least 50 or 100, but I guess it's going to be okay, maybe. Um, when it's all said and done, we have the, the minimum dV down here. The absolute minimum delta V that we need is 6,223.16. That's if everything goes according to plan then we will arrive at Earth with zero meters per second. Zero meters per second remaining. Now this um, actually does not take into account the delta V gain due to LOX consumption. That is over here. Uh, so 6,252.11 would be the total amount of delta V that we would have if uh, we're you know, taking into account DV gain due to LOX consumption. So, but this is this has to be set up this way, because this is how much the minimum fuel to accomplish each of these things are. So basically, what we're saying in in this minimum DV requirement is that our DV gain due to LOX consumption is just going to be a bonus. It's going to be extra delta V that we have to work with. And since I'm cutting it so close on this flight, we're probably going to need that. But if we want to give ourselves a one percent margin of error then we would, we would want that amount of delta V. And if we wanted a 3% margin of error, we would want that amount of delta V for starters, you know, for up here. Okay, so that is a o overview of the uh, spreadsheet. And again, I really hope it's not boring for you guys. If it is, just let me know in the uh, comments down below. And uh, I guess really, you know, again, again if you just don't want to watch it, you don't have to. That's all there is to it. But I think this is interesting, and I think it will help people uh, become better orbinauts. I was just telling Dimitri today, in fact, that I really appreciate all the all the help he's given me in the last you know uh, eighteen months or so. If you go back and look at my Learn with Me number one that I did, and you look at those videos from that time frame and before then, you can see just a huge 
huge difference in my own my own skill set, my own knowledge. Back then, when I was doing videos, like when I went from Earth to Jupiter, or rather Mars to Jupiter, I had no idea how if I had enough fuel or not. I just loaded up the XR5 with some arbitrary amount of fuel modules and pressed the plus button on the numeric keypad and went for it. And I arrived at the destination and I didn't have enough fuel. And I didn't even know how to know. So going from there to where I'm at today is a, is a big difference. And I, and I hope that if people, if a certain segment of Orbinauts do find this interesting, then at least this type of overview will help them start thinking about how to do fuel planning for themselves. So and so you don't just load up the XR2 with the, you know, a crazy engine ISP or turn on the unlimited fuel and go everywhere. That's just not a very satisfying way to uh, to play Orbiter, in my opinion. Now, I was actually thinking I was going to do this whole video in 30 minutes, um, make the whole trip, explain this and get up off of Mars and go out to Earth and everything, obviously that's not going to happen. So I'm going to go ahead and end this part of the video here, even though I'm only at 22 minutes, 21 minutes. And then when I come back, I will start at, you know, Mars and we'll take off and we'll execute the flight. I think that'll be better anyway. That way people that don't want to watch this setup or this explanation of the fuel setup and planning, then they can just completely tune out of it. So if you like the part of this part of the video, like it. If you didn't like it, don't like it. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. Links are down below, and I will see you in the next part.